As a young graduate student in the early 1980s, the text for my course in group therapy was, what a surprise, The Theory and Practice of Group Psychotherapy by Irvin Yalom. We all read the book avidly before and after each class and turned to it after each group meeting to find clarity and solace in its description of group phenomena and therapeutic technique. All these years later, I'm still likely to peruse its pages when I find myself stuck with some recurrent problem. How does Yalom deal with that group monopolizer? This text is now in its fifth edition with Molin Lesh and remains the text in the field. From this seminal work, Dr. Yalom expanded his impact with several te- textbooks, numerous papers and videos, and then moved into novels and teaching tales, all focused on psychology and psychotherapy. These books, which are too many to enumerate here, have enlightened and entertained us. I often prescribe the Schopenhauer cure to help the idea of group come alive to a reluctant patient. A documentary about his life titled Yalom's Cure was released in 2014. It explores his life and work, motivations behind his interests, and is playing at festivals around the country and available online, I believe. Dr. Yalom's most recent work, Creatures of a Day, has just been published and is available in our bookstore. He will do a book signing at 2 p.m. today in the, in the exhibit area. Dr. Yalom is an emeritus professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, has won too many awards <laughs> to mention here, <laughs> and is a distinguished life fellow of AGPA. He continues to write and practice here in the Bay Area, and we are so pleased that he has agreed to appear today, interviewed by my annual meeting co-chair, Dr. Hank Fallon. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. I'm trying to capture what I'm feeling right now. And I have a mixture of anxiety, imagine that, and uh, great excitement, and um, curiosity. I have curiosity about talking with you, how that's going to go. And um, so I'm, I'm ready to do this. OK, good. I, really, um, the meeting started off uh, Tuesday with Dr. Seizel talking about courage in his opening address, and then certainly um, uh, Dr. Zimbardo talked about courage, and you have mentioned it in your writing, courage about not only the uh, what the patient, the courage the patient has, um, but also courage that the therapist has. And I'm wondering if you could speak perhaps to both of those, um, how how you conceptualize that, especially, I think, in this case, with the therapist. Okay, courage. Um, Well, let me have the courage to ask whether you all can hear me. Is that uh, people, people in the back? Not great. I don't mind at all. Maybe Marsha will have some feelings about this. If any of you want to move your chairs up a little closer and the fire department doesn't mind, it's fine with me. Uh, Get the volume up, which is a way of of saying she doesn't like my idea very much. Uh, So... uh, Courage. You mean courage in, in the therapy group and leading the therapy group? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you do sometimes have to go against the group flow. Uh, you do feel people get caught up in a, in a uh, wave of feelings, and you have to sometimes take a stand. You have to learn how to step back. 
from it and begin to comment on the process. Uh, and that, that's all part of the training of the group therapist. Uh, the first group I was uh, in as a member, I, I'd come to Stanford. I graduated from my Hopkins uh, residency in uh, 1960 and then was drafted for a couple of years. All, all medical students were drafted in those days and had a couple of years in the Army where I did a lot of group therapy with, with uh, officers' wives, with officers' Uh, with the residents at Kaneohe State Hospital. So I had already had a lot of group therapy uh, under my belt. And then I, uh, and then I started uh, organizing a, a program at Stanford. I went to a, uh, a long tea group meeting, National Training Labs. This may not, uh, may, be, may not be known to you, but it was sort of the, the father of the whole tea group movement. And then which morphed into the encounter group movement uh, in another 10 years. Uh, we're offering uh, all, all week, maybe 10 day workshops, both in Bethel, Maine, and in uh, Arrow Lake Arrowhead in California. So I, I was kind of interested in what was going on in these groups. And I attended as, as a member in Lake Arrowhead for about 10 days. And the leader of that group <clears throat> started the group in, I thought, a rather courageous way. Uh, and all she said to this group of about, there were about 12 or 13 of us, was uh, we're going to be meeting here three hours a day for the next 10 days, and I would like everything you say to be in the here and now, period. Uh, I thought that was a little courageous, and there was a long silence, didn't seem to face her very much. And then uh, the members began to talk about that comment. Uh, several of them were very angry. What kind of an introduction is that? You know, uh, what does that mean? How do we stay in the here and now? We don't have any history. We're just meeting one another. I don't even know anyone's names. So lots of anger. And then other people were saying, you know, I kind of like this silence. It lets me meditate a little bit. I feel kind of calm and collected. Uh, and on and on, lots of different kinds of responses to that. Uh, and for me... Uh, a little piece of courageous behavior, I'm trying to stay with yeah. her courage, uh, of the leader was very, very informative. In fact, it, th that was a real game changer for me as I watched what was happening. Because what was happening was that there was a, uh, there was a single stimulus, which is what that leader said. And then there were all these different responses by the group members, anger, or peaceful meditation, or this, or challenging her, or not knowing what to do, or feeling helpless. And it, it was very apparent to me that there's one stimulus, many responses, there's only one possible answer to that, which is that we're dealing with 12 different inner worlds. And uh, suddenly it became very clear to me that if we focus on the here and now, that's the royal road into the inner worlds of the members of the group. So that's the first thought that comes to my mind when you yes. talk about courage in, in group leader, being able to take a stand and not be too shaky about it, and then, of course, run to your supervisor after the group is, is over. It is difficult to stay in the here and now, to keep the group in the here and now if you're not used to doing that, and sometimes even when you are, right. because the resistance to, to that is uh, quite large. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that, does take, that does take courage, too. When you, another free association that I have about courage, I, I really want to uh, speak in a way that will be useful to you all. So that I'm going to keep my comments in, in that direction. Uh, another thought that comes to my mind with courage, when I started leading groups uh, for the first time, I, I decided that I would, uh, I, I know that you don't have time in your clinical practice to do this very often, but I would dictate a note about the group. This is in my textbook. A summary of the group meeting. And mail this out to the members uh, before the next session. Now, of course, you can email. It would be much easier. And uh, if, that took a little bit of courage for me. And when I had residents ask them to do it, they did not want to do that. And it really took them some months to, to feel comfortable enough to, to expose yourself in that way. But I, I, in the, in the uh, summary I sent to patients, I tried to summarize what was happening in the group. And I usually I had a formula. Uh, if you think of a group meeting, there are usually about two or three themes that are going on in the group. We did this, and then we focused on this, we focused on this. And then I thought of each member's contribution to those themes. 
And in addition to that, I thought about my contributions and what I was trying to do with what I said. And, and then I thought of all the things I said that I was sorry I did, or maybe <laughs> things that I was sorry I didn't say. So I just mailed that out to the patients. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to achieve in that was that the group would be a continuous meeting. I wanted there to be as much continuity as possible between this meeting and the last meeting. And the last meeting. I do that with individual therapy too. If ever I start an individual session, I usually will start feelings about the last session left over. Uh, I'd like to, to, join the, uh, to, to join the meetings. Um, so I, I started doing this summary, and that felt like a, nobody had done that before, so that felt like a bit of a, a, a courageous thing. Just as an a, a extraneous thing, I'm free association here, but um, I started, many years later, I started doing groups of dying patients, people with cancer, with, with a metastatic cancer, and I got very uh, anxious about that. And um, I'd, I'd never really worked with dying patients in the past. And I, I, I was astounded when I began to look inside myself for resources about how to deal with this, that I had had a lot of individual therapy. I had had 700 hours of an orthodox analysis in my residency, and never once had the idea of death come up into the meeting. So. Uh, that, that quite astounded me. So I got back into therapy at that point. I saw Rollo May uh, for some therapy to help me deal with this issues. One of the things I did with Rollo May was that he lived a long way away. He lived in Tiburon, which is the other side of the bay, um, up in Marin, and I lived at Stanford. Uh, so it was about an hour and 20 minutes. I, that was a commute for me every week. And I decided I'd use the time for the commute by taping the session with Rollo and then listening to it on my way to the next session. Uh, and again, that, that really made this a very continuous uh, session. Um, I thought it was a rather uh, gutsy thing for me to ask him to do that. And he seemed totally unperturbed about, about doing that. Uh, so that went very well, too. Okay, that's all my free associations. Okay. okay. You, you, in, in part of that, you, you were talking about what you were disclosing. And in your book, Creatures of a Day, um, you have a, a, a tale in there, I believe it's Charles, where Charles, in the session, asks you um, what you're really thinking. And you made a statement that uh, you, in that shared with the reader that earlier in your career, that question would have rattled you quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But as a more mature therapist, you'd grown to trust the, uh, your unconscious to behave. Mm -hmm. And then you, um, you, you answered his question. Right. And I'm curious about that and, and how much you self-disclose, how you make those decisions. I think that group summary was my, my first real exercise in self-disclosure. Was I talking about the things I said and then talking about maybe I shouldn't have said that, you know, already acknowledging mistakes. Uh, I'm probably, if we take a continuum of this whole audience here and where you are on this continuum of self-disclosure, I'm way over to one side. Uh, I fairly, I disclose fairly heavily to group members uh, and to individual therapy members uh, very much. I, I had a, as I mentioned, a, a several hundred hour psychoanalysis four times a week for three years when I first started my residency. It was a, with a very orthodox, rigid Freudian analyst with the old style. She was invisible on end of the couch. Uh, the only comments she made were interpretive comments. And uh, I ended up that, with that 700 hours learning, learning one really important thing about therapy, which is that is a very, very bad model for, for <laughs> It, it, it's the most expensive lesson I, I had, but but it served me it served me very well. You know, we rarely thank those who teach yeah, us yeah, the right, most. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, and and after that, as I came into contact, for example, with Carl Rogers' work. Uh, in which there is so much evidence stemming from his work and the thousands of dissertations that are done by his students. 
about the importance of the relationship between the patient and the therapist. It's really overwhelming data, uh, overwhelmingly positive data. You know, the, and Carl Rogers developed certain major characteristics of therapists, you know, in terms of accurate empathy and unconditional positive regard and genuineness. I really believe those. They, they, they are very important contribution, and I uh, greatly admired Carl Rogers, who was our first, um, our first researcher into psychotherapy, and one of the very first psychologists, by the way, to do psychotherapy. When I was uh, uh, trained as a, in psychiatry, uh, I, I, I finished my residency in 1960, a psychologist could not do psychotherapy unless they were supervised by a psychiatrist. Uh, so that's how far the field has come in terms of who does psychotherapy in this country. So, I mean, so right now I'm, I'm quite self-disclosing. If a patient were to ask me a question about have I seen such and such a movie or do I have children or whatever, I, what's the big deal? Of course I answer that. If I want to be a person, I want to be genuine to that person, so yes, I will answer the questions. A lot of young uh, neophytes in our field are somewhat hesitant about that because there's a kind of feeling, maybe it's so present, I know it was when I was younger, that, God, you open the door and where's it going to end? You know, they're going to be asking you what your masturbation practice is or whatever. <laughs> uh, but... But you know that never happens. <laughs> and, and if it were to happen, if the patient were to ask you questions like that, well, we have something important to fall back on. We fall back on process. And we begin to ask the question one way or the other, uh, what is the pale for you in embarrassing me so? You know, so because the process has turned into something the patient is asking a question which is obviously going to make me uncomfortable. So you begin to take a look at that part. You stay in, in process. Uh, and there are many patients that I see that um, I, will, I will say to them, what questions do you have for me? I encourage them to ask questions. I have a patient that I've been seeing who has an, almost an archetypal memory of when she had just no, she was about 23 or so, in the same field with her father, who was almost Nobel laureate level in his field. And he, they took a train ride when he, she, she was in her early 20s for a couple of hours. And her father never addressed a question to her, never found out what she was doing in school. Uh, it was just as though she wasn't there, whereas he was very interested in her brother, who was in a similar field too. Uh, and, and this has nagged at her all the time. And she has returned to that memory over and over again in the few months that I've seen her. Uh, and I was saying to her the other day, this goes back to courage a little bit, that, uh, you know, I've been thinking that this therapy with me, an older man, somebody who you respect and you think is wise, is, is maybe the closest you're ever going to get to replicating that train ride with your father. So could we try and do it differently? Could we talk in a different way? You know, what questions would you have of me? I'll tell you anything. And so I'm trying to engage her on a question. She's almost crippled. She can't do it yet. Uh, she's engaging very, very, very carefully. She wants to know my views on classical music. Uh, she was very disappointed when I told her I had a totally tin ear. Uh, she wanted to know whether or not I was an ardent Zionist. So she asked questions like that. And I began to comment, those are awfully imperson impersonal, impersonal questions. You know, I keep thinking I'm asking you to dance and you won't dance with me. That was the way we ended our last session. So these are examples of maybe extreme self-disclosure. It, it um, being able to self-disclose and uh, uh, be in the moment with somebody that you're working with, either an individual or group, is uh, something I think that you really have to uh, acquire and practice mm -hmm. with a lot. But a lot of therapy today is not geared toward that. That's right. That's right. You, you do have to practice it, and that's why I say to so many therapists so often, 
the most important thing you can do in your training is to get into therapy and to get into therapy for a long time and to get into therapist, therapy more than once and if possible get into therapy with therapists of different persuasions to kind of know what it is like uh, to, be, to be in treatment. Um, so I, I think you really need to learn how it is to be a patient and learn how to work yourself in therapy. Uh, another ideal vehicle for training is the kind of experience that was offered here three days ago, the experiential groups. Those are, are extremely valuable, and it would be even better if you could get into an ongoing experiential group. Uh, they're offered in many programs now, but they're usually offered short term. Um, about 20, maybe 25 years ago now, I got a call from a colleague. It was a group of uh, therapists who all occupied a suite of offices. And they met as a group once in a while. They met for case conferences and supervision. They said, we're thinking of forming a, a uh, support group. And would you be interested in joining as a member? Not, a peer not, group. Not as a leader. So I, I joined that group. And we had about 10 of us in there. And we've been meeting for 25 years. Once every other week, hour and a half. And it's a therapy group for therapists. It's a support group. It's sometimes supervision group, peer supervision. Uh, we will talk about patients, but usually generally only if it's touched off some important counter-transferential issues, which brings our own feelings into the into the. So I have that support group. Uh, that's tremendously good training, I think, for how to how to work in therapy. And I feel badly about people who graduate a program only on CBT and not having an extent extend a chance to really learn how to explore yourself. I think it would be very, very difficult to do this for a living without having that connection with other people. Yeah. I, I think so, too. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I, my inclination is not to want to refer patients to therapists who have never been in therapy uh, themselves before. I had a strange experience with something like this. Let me just tell you, this, this is really way out and high tech. But there's a whole new field that's just emerging now of doing therapy online. Uh, and there, there are three or four different uh, programs that are on the web right now. Uh, one of them I've been consulting a little bit with this place is one called Talkspace. And the therapy is people sign on for this. People who can't really afford therapy. Uh, as a general given, say pay maybe a hundred dollars, and they have unlimited access to a therapist for a month, say. Uh, so I'm supervising the head therapist there, and um, and um, and you're getting, you know, I, I feel like good God, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. How do you do therapy by texting? And I don't want to have anything to do with it. But I'm trying to stay young, keep curious. <laughs> maybe this will be a move of the future. And I'm learning a few things. It's not quite as wacky as I thought it was. I've been seeing instances where actually the patients seem to be definitely improving. And I don't have to take anybody's word for it, by the way, because I have the whole text of therapy in front of me. Every word the patient writes in the therapist is right there. That's, a, that's, a, that's a rather unique. Uh, and I'm learning a couple of other things. I'm learning that, um, that, for example, they say, maybe this is true, that the therapists are generally anonymous. They don't give their own name. They don't have to. That they are more inclined to be more self-revealing than they might be face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little skeptical of that. And, and then she told me about a patient who's been telling her he says he told her something about himself he has never told to a therapist that he'd seen for 10 years. And I couldn't believe that either. She said, well, what he talked about was the fact that he only wore, likes to have sex with diapers on. And I thought, that's strange. She said he never had the courage to say that to his therapist. You know, and I muse, coming out of another century entirely, well, maybe that part of that particular idea is to ensure that he really won't be able to have sex because after all he's not going to meet many people wanting sex if he's got diapers on 
Whereas she informed me, oh no, quite the contrary. <laughs> that, there, that there are websites up for, for people who like to wear diapers while having sex. Uh, and I looked them up, and they are, and I'm really feeling, <laughs> I'm really feeling from another century. But anyway, these are some th things I'm learning from her. Oh, but back to your question. <laughs> you digress. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> the question was, I'm thinking that there is something about how you offer therapy online, and I don't think people can do that unless they've been trained as a good therapist. But I also don't think a good therapist can do that unless they've been kind of trained in this new way of doing it. So I'm saying, you know, I really think that everyone who's going to be a therapist in this program should be in therapy themselves, in this text therapy, and see what it's like. So I'm, I'm pushing on that and, and uh, seeing if that would work. One of, the, one of the advances that is happening in that is that um, it's actually moving from just simply text to be able to actually see the individual, see the face, and engage in that way. So you're not losing, in one sense, you're not losing quite as much information. Um, you may lose some of that anonymity that yeah. you're referring to, but it, it offers uh, uh, a way to do... Uh, groups on a distance right. basis in different parts of the country right. or uh, world. Uh, but my feeling was that this text therapy is a fine way to start, and then we're going to graduate to Skype therapy and maybe even face-to-face. -face. But that doesn't seem to be always the case. They say some people are, are prefer just to, yes. keep, just to keep it on text. I've been, I felt a similar feeling about five years ago about uh, doing therapy by Skype. If I treasure the intimate personal relationship with someone. Skype seemed to me to be a terrible way to meet. But I've, changed, I've had a real change of mind since then. Uh, I, I've, I've talked about this in other places. Maybe you've heard me say this before. But I had a call some years ago from a patient who was in an extremely isolated country uh, where there wasn't a therapist within 1,000 miles. And... Um, in fact, she'd gone to that country to be isolated, to get away from everyone and away from a love broken love relationship. So I agreed to uh, I agreed to, to start some Skype therapy with her, and I found it a very. I think I was being very helpful to this woman. I think it was rewarding. And as a matter of fact, I don't think she could have been in, in the room with me because mm. she was so averse to to being intimate with anyone. So since then, I, I do quite a bit of Skype therapy. Maybe third, to my, really? 40% of my patients are in various places in the world doing Skype therapy. Wow. So, um, but, and, and there were attempts to do this on the, group, on the web, too, with groups. They set this program up originally, but it's just too awkward uh, to, to do this. Uh, well, but, Heim is doing that, and um, he has uh, he has probably more, as much experience as anyone in yeah. that using that multiple screens, yeah, multiple screens, and people can see each other. People can see each other. Yes, in, in real time. In, in real time, right? They start off that way. A lot of people didn't want to be seen, so they'd have a just an icon up there for them. Yes. So, uh, part of what you're talking about in this is what's helpful, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think one of the things we all know is, is that um, the people we work with oftentimes find something helpful and it never even entered our radar, and yet we have a completely different formulation of what's helpful. Can you say, address that or speak about that yeah. in your experience? Oh, I, I think very often if you can really have... A, a, a deep interview with people at the end of therapy to find out what were the most helpful things to them. You'll often find things that surprise you enormously. Uh, that's one of the themes in the new book of stories I have, Love's Executioner. There are three or four stories in where the patient was helped, but by things that I had no idea that this particular thing would be helpful to them. And the, the book is called Creatures of a Day, and that's a quotation from Marcus Aurelius as he talks about the whole theme of how ephemeral we are. 
And so the quote starts, we are but creatures of a day. Um, and so and one of the stories deals with Marcus Urios. I had a couple of patients who I thought, for various reasons that the story goes into, they, they might be helped by reading what some of the confessions of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and as it turned out, um, it, it was much more complicated than that. For one thing, they were helped by different parts of Marcus Aurelius and picked very different aspects of what they learned from Marcus Aurelius. So they pick what they, what they feel they can use. And I ended the story by, by picking something out of Marcus Aurelius that would be good for me at, at, my, at my stage of life as well. Well, in talking about your writings, I think writing, whether it's uh, uh, professional writing or whether it is fictional writing, takes a high degree of creativity. And I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, talk about the creative process for yourself and uh, both uh, in therapy and in your, the writing that you do and how they're maybe similar and how they're different. So uh, the idea of, 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 being, of being creative, for one thing, in my, in my training uh, in psychiatry as a resident, I was around uh, uh, a couple of people who were very eclectic in their views. This was Jerry Frank, who in some ways was the, uh, a pivotal figure in the history of group therapy and really did the first work on group therapy. And uh, I watched his group for my years as a resident, a little tiny one two-way mirror that was about so big and all of us had to just put our heads around in a circle to see what we could from the group. Uh, I felt that was a very good way to, to, to train people, and I always had my groups observed by, by my students. But they were very empirical. They wanted to find out what worked and didn't hold beliefs. And for that reason, I was very much uh, opposed to a, a more rigid psychoanalytic institute. One of the reasons I didn't enter that, I'd much rather try to find different, different ways to, to be creative. So I, I tried to do that throughout my career. Uh, and tried to experiment with things. When I had my residents watch my therapy group, um, the groups uh, permitted that. They knew they were being observed. You have to tell them, of course, and they groused about it. If they didn't want to enter the group, that was, that was also uh, some, the choice of some people. But they didn't like being observed. So I tried to, so I tried to, be, to take some methods that might make this a little bit more creative experience. So I, I changed the format a bit. So I had the residents watch the therapy group. Afterwards, I would have a ha rehash the meeting with the residents. But now I asked the residents to come into the group room, and then I asked the patients to go in the observation room. So <laughs> they got a chance to see the residents discuss the group. And they were really critical of the residents, you know. And, <laughs> God, these guys are more uptight than we are, and lessons like that. So, so that was that really that really energized the group quite a bit. And then we added we added another part of it onto it, which made the residents tour duty for this week much longer. But it, it worked out very well. Which was then we the patients had so many feelings we thought we'd give them another shot. So they take them back in the room, and with the residents watching, they talked about their observations of the observers. Uh, and, and I did the same thing uh, in an inpatient setting. I wrote a book called Inpatient Psychotherapy, Inpatient Group Psychotherapy, and had uh, the same format where we had groups watching this uh, 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 a group where people try to formulate an agenda of how this group might be helpful for them each day. Um, and the, uh, the members, at the end of the 45 minutes, they would switch places with the observers and, and then do a third switch then. So, so I felt those were rather creative ways to try to, to do group therapy. I also felt for myself, in terms of how much courage it took for me, uh, starting, starting to do groups of patients who are dying of cancer. That was probably, uh, I felt, a really uh, risky thing for me to do. It had not been done before. There are lots and lots of groups for cancer patients, almost every big hospital in the country right now has it, but there had never been a group like that before. So it took, took a lot of risk for me to do that. 
Uh, and it was that group, as I mentioned, that sent me running off to get some more therapy. Um, so what, in, in, in your writings... In my writing, yeah. What, what, do you, what do you feel that your writing has given you that you would not have, have gotten had you not pursued that? Well, I had another form of, of courage uh, trying to be born in my writing in which that... Uh, ever since I've been uh, a teenager, I've been uh, very, very much uh, addict, addicted or enamored of, of great writing. I've always uh, read novels uh, in my entire life, maybe ex with the exception of medical school when I, I didn't have the time. I've always read myself to sleep by reading a novel. I did last night. Uh, it's just part of me to, to read great fiction and to appreciate that. So there's a part of me that has always wanted to be a real writer. And so th that part of me was, was present in my, my psychiatric writing from the very beginning. Uh, and I tried to write in different ways. I think one of the very first articles I ever wrote, I was uh, in my residency and I was uh, spent a day a week in a, um, in a place like the East Coast equivalent, for those of you in California, to a Tascadero where uh, people were incarcerated for, uh, for crimes like uh, sexual crimes uh, with an indeterminate sentence. They were there until the therapist said they were well enough to leave. So I started doing groups of, of sexual uh, deviance uh, out there. And the first article I ever wrote was, was about voyeurism. But rather than write it in a more professional way, it was, it was uh, I got it into the American Psychiatric uh, Association Journal. I started off with voyeur, but the history of voyeurism and the whole question of Peeping Tom and, how, how, and where that legend came from. And Peeping Tom got into trouble. You may remember because the queen of the village, uh, Lady Godiva, was protesting uh, the taxes that had been placed on the whole village. And uh, for some reason or other, the governor uh, said that she, she could uh, re relieve those taxes if she would ride a horse naked through the town. And so she did that. And all the townspeople cooperated with her. They knew she was helping them by every, no one looking at her except Peeping Tom, of course, who was then blinded. Uh, for his transgression. So that was the original Peeping Tom. And it has a lot to do with voyeurism as we used to, as we used to think of it because the, voyeur, the voyeurism had to not just look at women eating out of burlesque shows or porn sites that weren't available then, but he would have to watch someone without their knowing that he was watching them. That was really part of it. So that was the first article that I read. So I, and then I began to infuse my, my, my books with, with stories. Uh, that is very true of the group therapy textbook. Uh, they, I, there are a lot of students, oh, a lot of students who've told me they enjoy reading this book because it, it doesn't read like a usual textbook. Uh, they're willing to put up with a lot of really dry stuff uh, because there might be an interesting story coming around the bend on the next page or two. Uh, so I've heard that again and again. So I have smuggled uh, bootlegged, uh, you know, probably a hundred stories in, in that textbook. And the same is true with my next textbook on existential therapy, uh, which took me even longer to write than, than the group therapy text. And then after that, I felt like I wanted to set that part of me uh, free, that wanted to be a writer. And that's when I started writing. Uh, rather than using stories to illustrate things in a textbook, I just tried to, I just decided on it different teaching technique. I would use a story, the narrative, to do the teaching. And then I wrote this book called Love's Executioner. And they were all meant, every story was meant to be a teaching tale. And every story I've ever written, including this last book of Creatures in a Day, are all meant to be teaching tales. And my secret audience is always the young psychotherapist. I know it's read by the general public in many ways, but my audience is really you. Um, and that also is true for all the, all the novels I've written as well. They're all to illustrate some aspect uh, of psychotherapy. You've recently had a movie made about you. And, and, part of that, and part of that process, 
people were with you while they were making it. So they got to see a lot about you. So they, they observed a lot about you. What was that like? Um, every time I hear about this movie, I squirm uh, <laughs> a little bit. There's a lot about that movie that makes me very uncomfortable, especially the title. It's awful. The, the, title, <laughs> the title is Yellum's Cure. Uh, I had nothing to do with the making of the movie and nothing to do with the title for sure. None of us have ever used the word cure uh, in, our, in our work. Uh, but a, 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 a team of, of filmmakers from Switzerland, a very, very good filmmaker, uh, approached me some years ago to make a film. And um, so they would visit me in California or if my family went on vacations in Hawaii, they would all come to Hawaii or once we whole family went to France, they came to France. So over the years, they filmed a tremendous amount, and they put out this, this documentary uh, about me with a lot of pictures from my youth and other things. So that film is being shown quite widely in Europe. Uh, in Germany, there are about 150,000 people who have seen it so far. Uh, I don't. Th it's come to the United States for a couple of film festivals in Mill Valley and San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I doubt if it'll be distributed in this country. This country doesn't really show documentaries very much, but European uh, theaters, it's quite common there. So it's playing in Germany now, and uh, Greece now, and France in a, in a couple of weeks. So a lot of European countries. So that's, that's that film. I suspect if it doesn't get distributed in this country, it'll come out on a DVD. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me shift a little bit. Um, you've talked some about working with uh, chronically ill individuals, and um, I th I'm wondering if, as you've become a more mature therapist, whether, not, whether you've been able to do that um, differently than when you were younger. Um, it changes when you get closer to that possibility. When you're younger, you have this uh, great I, I, belief that you're going to keep on going. Yeah, I, well, it's a great it's a great question. I mean, when I started working with terminally ill patients, um, I didn't know what I was doing, uh, and the reason I started working with terminally ill patients was I was writing this textbook on existential therapy, and I knew at least a third of that book was going to be about death, and I knew I had to learn a great deal, and my, and my patients that I had would be my teachers. Uh, and so, but I didn't know how to get my everyday patients to talk about death. Every time I tried to get into a conversation with a person who wasn't ill, I didn't succeed. I know how to do that a lot better now. So I thought that I would have to work with people who had to talk about death because they were given a death sentence. Uh, so I, as I say, I had a lot of anxiety about that. It drove me back into therapy. But I began to learn an awful lot. There were statements that people made in these first groups I had that I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten a, a man who, who said with a lot of exasperation, why did I have to wait till now, till my body was riddled with cancer, to learn how to live? Now, that was a tremendously important learning statement for me. And in fact, carved my whole direction in an existential approach. How do we get people to learn how to confront death earlier on so that they can change the way they live? I mean, that's, I'm not interested in scaring people. I'm interested in how do we change them so that they can live their life more fully. Or earlier on, before they're or ill early, at all. Earlier on, before they, before, they get a, before they get a death sentence. So I continue in my... I have a small practice now. I see two or three patients a day. But I'm always seeing one or two people who have a terminal illness even now. Uh, and I can do this with a lot more freedom, especially since I'm so much closer to my own death now. How about for younger therapists? There are many therapists who work in environments where uh, they're surrounded by that. Right. Well, uh, I think you'll need some help in the beginning. Um, I think you need, uh, and there are many ways to get help. The best one that I know of is to get yourself into, into therapy. Uh, a lot of people get help through Eastern means, through meditation. Uh, the uh, advanced Buddhist meditational approach is in a way learning how to 
confront and uh, incorporate the whole notion of Anicca, the whole notion of impermanence uh, over and over again, how all reality is constructed uh, by us. And, and that's, that's part of the Buddhist teaching. So that, that's another way to begin to, to deal with that. I've, that's never taken with me. Uh, I've tried on many occasions. Uh, so I'm just not a, uh, a natural meditator. I think I'm just too jumpy and, and uh, wanting to, too fast. But, but, it, but that's a good way of, of, for, for many people it's helped. Right. Uh, I, I think another way is it helped that I've confronted it so much and so often that I've begun to, to come to terms with it. And I think about it all the time. It, it, it's inevitable. It, it is. If anything is inevitable, it's inevitable that everything is impermanent. That's right. Yeah. That's right. right. All right. Are there any questions, questions that anyone would like to ask? Raina yes. is asking about um, a lot of poor people that are interested in seeking psychotherapy but don't have the funds and what uh, Dr. Yalom thinks about the issue and how we can help. Yes. Well, this is a, 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 a national world issue, and it's one that I'm really not expert in this area. But in one sense, the, the group therapy field is, is part of the answer to that. It, it offers a, a, a far less expensive, more potent approach to, to therapy. But of course, the very poor can't even afford, uh, afford to, do, to do that. I'm supervising a, uh, a therapist. I've been supervising a therapist in Germany. Uh, and the German government offers all their citizens, uh, I think it's 80 sessions of group therapy. Uh, can you imagine that? And, we, and, and they pay $75 for a group therapy session, probably for each individual in the therapy group. So there are a lot of therapists in Germany doing and offering good mm-hmm. group psychotherapy, but uh, this country can't even, can't even get Obama pair passed very well. There have been and there are being enormous advances in neuroscience. Would you say something about biological treatments and psychotherapy? It, it's not. It's really. It's really not my strength to talk about biological treatments. I really concentrated on the on a different end of of our field, and I stopped. I've stopped prescribing medications about ten years ago, and I'm not keeping up with that part of the field. I have a lot of respect for it, gone through that kind of training, but I've been so deeply immersed in, in my approach to therapy and an existential approach to therapy that I, I can't stay up with that. Sorry. You, um, Dr. Yalom, <clears throat> um, you mentioned as you're approaching your own death, and thank you for saying that, I'm curious, like, what sorts of things, looking back on your life, have given you meaning? I think I, I consider myself uh, very fortunate. First of all, you mentioned about my coming towards the end of my life. I think that's true. One exercise, the movie starts uh, with my saying to a patient, you, the, something that I say very often, not original, by the way, but if you, if you just draw a line on a sheet of paper, and I think of one end of the line being your birth and one end of the line being your death, would you please put a check to where you think you are now? And just that simple exercise can cause people to do some mighty thinking about their, their own life. And of course, my check is way at the, uh, at the one end. I've outlived uh, most of my peers. Um, I started coming to this organization, to the group, American Group Psychotherapy, when I was uh, probably 1962. I think it was my first presentation here. I don't see anybody here who was there at that point. So, so that, that reminds me of, of really of my age. So I, yes, I feel that I'm very far at one end. Uh, I, feel, I feel very fortunate in life in that I feel that I'm, I'm really, uh, if anything, a, an overachiever. I think I've fulfilled all the things that I've wanted to do. Um, and I, I, count, I count my blessings. I don't have a lot of regrets. One thing I ask patients over and over again, I will ask patients about uh, what regrets do you have in your life? And when people start talking about the regrets, and some people, I had a patient tell me yesterday, I've wasted my whole life 
You know, that is a tragic statement. Uh, and, and then I want to know a little bit more about the regrets. And then I want to ask the question uh, that gives you a little bit more crunch is, you know, well, if you were to see me, let's imagine a thought experiment. You were to see me a year from now or two years from now, would you please tell me what new regrets you would have built up? Right? And then you ask the real crunch question, well, what could you do to lead a regret-free life so that you weren't building up day by day more and more regrets? How would you change your life? I've taken that idea very seriously in my life. So um, I, I left Stanford all about, I don't know, 15 years ago uh, because, maybe it has to do with the last question that was just asked me, is the field had gotten too medicalized for me. The psychiatry residents I was having then weren't very interested in psychotherapy. They're mainly interested in biological and, and, the, and psychopharmacology. And I felt I didn't have a lot of receptive residents. So I did an unusual thing. I gave up my tenure and just uh, decided I will do a little private practice and I'll have my time free for writing and I'll try and consider that my students are no longer just psychiatric residents, but all psychotherapists at large. Uh, and I, you know, so I feel very fulfilled. Uh, I, I love being a writer. I love being a therapist. I, I feel, as I hope many of you do, that we are in a blessed field. I mean, first of all, just the, just the, the operational day-to-day -day thing, how many fields can we be in that we can just see two or three hours a day if we want? I assure you cardiac surgeons can't do that. Nobody, nobody in my field of medicine can do that very easily. We can keep on seeing patients. And for me, uh, I, I love doing this work. Uh, it's a blessing. I can't believe I'm getting paid sometimes to have patients come in and give me these, you know, the, this, this blessing of sharing this intimate story that they have. And every story is different. Uh, and then I... Uh, can exercise my own empathy and my own creativity to help them uh, see that story and change that story in a, in a different way. So I, I feel quite fulfilled in my work right now. And, and that is also true with my uh, domestic life. I've been, I've been with the same woman since I was 16 years old um, and have an uh, absolutely astounding wife. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to share with us some of your favorites or maybe something that was impactful for you. Now, I've read it. I've read all the great novels. And lately I've been running out of them. I don't like a lot of the new authors. I guess I'm getting too old. So I've been looking at, I was looking at the Guardian, the British Guardian 100 Best Novels. And there are a few on there I haven't read, so I've been reading those. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of a couple of Trollope novels. So right at the moment I'm saying The Way We Were. Uh, a, a great Trollope novel. And before that, there was a novel that all the 100 best novelists have called The Way of All Flesh by Samuel Butler, also early 19th century novel. So I read uh, The Way of All Flesh, and I love that novel. It's a really good novel. Uh, so I've stayed with that. Uh, before that, I read Murakami's last book, uh, and David Mitchell. Uh, who's one of my favorite writers. I read his last book but didn't like it very much. But everything else he's, read, he's written has been, has been quite wonderful. So I, I have fairly uh, high taste for good literature. Uh, and then once in a while we'll, we'll love to read good science fiction. Ah, science fiction. Okay. What's the last I went I through wrote? I went through an eye operation recently, about three or four weeks ago, where I had to stay straight on my back for 44 for uh, 48, for 96 hours, that was tough. So I listened to an audible book of Gone Girl. That was, a, that was, a, that was a great audible book. It really got me through those, those 48 hours. What What's the last sci-fi book you read? The last sci-fi book. Oh, I read a book called uh, Unusual and Precious Things, something like that, by a man named. Faber, F-A-B-E-R. Uh -huh. uh, it was a big front page review in the New York Times. However, the review talked about a previous book he had written, which they thought was much better, which I read too. And that's a book called The, the Crimson Petal and the White. 
Crimson Petal of Light. And that's a 19th century novel. He writes it as though he were Dickens. Huh. And it's a terrific novel. Uh, I love that novel. Better than the Better, better than, than the new one. one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, last question there. Let's get one over here somewhere. Uh, well, someone has the mic. I'm sorry. Oh, right okay. There. Sorry. You mentioned that you had to, you felt like you had to give up the biology about 10 years ago because you wanted to focus more on psychotherapy. My question to you is, do you think it's possible to be equally invested in both psychotherapy and biology, and, or do you kind of have to pick? W without doubt. I, I have a good number of, of psychiatric colleagues who, who stayed up with psychopharmacology but are also excellent therapists. Uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't my, my choice to do. But yes, that is certainly true. You can very easily keep up with both. And there are in very important innovations occurring all the time in psychopharmacology. I'm not, I'm not denigrating it whatsoever. Uh, my training started when uh, in, I was a resident at, at Johns Hopkins 1957. There was no psychobiological uh, help for us, really. The first tranquilizer had not come out. It was about a year into my training when, when, when Thorazine uh, first came out. That made an enormous difference in the field. Uh, but when I first started, we didn't have anything. A, a drug called Equinil had just, had just been invented. So at that point, I didn't feel like uh, medical biology had a lot to offer. Nor did I, nor was I very interested in a a, a what, orthodox psychoanalytic approach because of my own analysis. Uh, and, uh, and that's when I got interested, perhaps maybe there's a third way. Mm -hmm. And I read Rollo May's book on existence in my resident. It just came out when I was a second year resident. I read that and it introduced me to the whole world. I'd never taken a course in philosophy before. And I said, I better get myself a full, uh, an education in philosophy because great wise men have been interested in the kinds of ideas we deal with with human beings for thousands of years. And so I began to make it my life mission to see if we could add these ideas, incorporate these ideas into our field. So that's the particular direction I, I chose. But I do not mean to be yeah. uh, denigrating the, yeah. the psychobiological direction. Well, thank you very much, Irv. Thank you. Thank you very much.